today the ccp orator is professor nilika malavige professor nilika malavige is the head department of immunology and molecular medicine and the director of the center for dengue research at the faculty of medicine medical sciences university of sri jayawardenepura she is also an academic visitor at the mrc human immunology unit university of oxford and a member of the executive committee of the international society of infectious diseases she has been carrying out research on dengue immunopathology and pathogenesis of vascular leak for several years and since the onset of covid-19 pandemic is now also studying the immune response to sars cov2 virus nilika has received many local and international research grants including research grants from nih usa british high commission sri lanka nsf and nrc she has more than 150 research publications in peer reviewed journals she has won many awards for research both internationally and nationally she has more than 3000 citations and the h index of 28 she has delivered many orations including the pb fernando oration in 2014 annual conference of the ccp she is the editor of several prestigious journals including uh, the editorial associate of bmc infectious diseases and a member of the editorial board of the international journal of infectious diseases on a personal note i had the privilege of working together with uh, nilika in uh, many research project and that was uh, uh, very much of a learning experience for me and uh, uh, i'm very happy today to have nilika professor nilika malavige as the ccp orator may i invite nilika to accept the medal for oration and deliver the oration Thank you, sir, for that introduction, uh, President uh, Dr. Arali J. Vikram of Ceylon College of Physicians, uh, Chief Guest uh, Dr. Pali Thaboi Khan, uh, Guest of Honor uh, Professor Andrew Gollard, uh, Royal College of Physicians, London, the Joint Secretaries, Council Members, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed the greatest honor to be delivering this uh, oration on uh, the immunological and molecular epidemiological aspects of COVID-19 in Sri Lanka. So last year around December when we heard this mysterious pneumonia affecting China we actually were scared but mainly very so uh, feeling very sorry for the chinese people that they are facing such uh, problems and uh, when, when that start happening in january then only we thought okay this is not looking good uh, at even in december or january i think many of us did not think that we will be facing the situation we are facing right now and of course uh, as expected we did start getting uh, covid-19 in sri lanka uh, the first sri lankan cases in march uh, we went to into a extensive lockdown for two months which curbed the epidemic but we got uh, the cnc cluster a little bit in april the navy cluster then a little bit uh, from middle east returnees the kandagadu cluster and then we sort of end into a nice honeymoon period so august and september were really good months uh, where we did not adhere to the new normal but actually went back to our normal life and i know everybody was very relaxed and very happy with what we had but of course that uh, our happiness didn't last long and we know that uh, covid-19 has str uh, struck back so um, but as dr palita boykon said uh, all of us might be thinking we are in a very uh, 
difficult situation, a grave situation, but that depends on who we compare ourselves to. Through like uh, countries like Taiwan and Singapore, uh, I'm not uh, talking about Thailand and Taiwan, I'm not talking about the number of cases, but uh, I think a better reflection is the number of cases per million population. They are doing quite well with very few cases per million population, and of course, uh, a number of deaths. Compared to these countries, uh, Sri Lanka is not doing well. But then there are so many affluent countries with much more resources than Sri Lanka who are doing terribly uh, uh, in, a, in a terrible situation. For instance, Europe, they are facing their second wave with hundreds, uh, basically or more than 500 deaths in most European countries. If you look at the data yesterday, US had 1,900 and something deaths with 150,000 new cases. And of course, we are uh, in the middle of epidemic, but if we compare ourselves with more affluent countries, we are not that bad. Now, when we experienced COVID-19, uh, first started experiencing COVID-19 in February, and we knew that it's going to come to Sri Lanka, we had many questions that we wanted to answer. Uh, so uh, I, I've highlighted them in different colors. So the, the ones in blue I'll be talking about today. Basically, what are the viral strains in Sri Lanka and why are they, asso are they associated with higher or lower transmission rates? Uh, and of course, if the, is the viral strains changing rapidly? At that time, we didn't know whether this was a rapidly mutating virus and it will get virulent or cause problems or uh, how we are going to face it. Then the pathogenesis of COVID-19. Uh, what, what are the role of cytokines, chemokines? Can we find any drug targets like we did for dengue? And of course, neutralizing antibodies, are they protective? If so, what would be the implications for vaccines? How long would they last? We are also looking at T cell responses, which I'm not talking about. We are doing a little bit of uh, work on mucosal immunity, which again, I won't talk about. And the ones highlighted in red are the ones that we are planning to do in future, which are looking for biomarkers to see if we can predict disease severity, and most importantly, to identify therapeutic targets. Now I'll come to the sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus because uh, for some reason it became, uh, uh, the whole general population became interested in it rather than the scientific community. But basically why, uh, why do you want to sequence viruses? Uh, of course, to understand the origin of the virus, I'm not talking about which country it came from, but still the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we know that it originated from a bat, but there's a big question about the intermediate host. Is it this pangolin or is it something else? So that initial mystery has still not been answered. How rapidly is the virus mutating? If it is very rapidly mutating, that is not good news for vaccines, as we know that for the influenza vaccine, we have to change the vaccine every year. And uh, is it uh, acquiring certain nasty mutations that would lead to more virulence, or is it going to be less virulent in future and be like a normal flu? And of course, how to understand how well we are containing epidemic based on the number of strains circulating in a particular country. Then of course, we want to do mutation and analysis, again, to see the virulence, uh, to make sure that uh, whether it's acquiring nasty mutations, and we can, by studying mutation analysis, we can uh, find out local transmission versus imported cases, and low intensity community transmission versus high intensity community transmission. So those are important epidemiological uh, questions. So now coming to viral strains, people are uh, interested about viral strains, but it's not uh, as simple as that, because there are several classifications. There's this GIS, uh, GIS 8 classification, which talks about seven uh, major strains. Then the next strain, which is the most popular site, uh, talks about five clades. And then this pangolin lineages, which stands for phylogenetic assignment of named global outbreak lineages, talks about A, B, and C. So I'll just briefly explain what is important. So the most popular site is this uh, SARS uh, next strain, which has deposit, uh, which all countries deposit their sequences for all the scientists everywhere in the world to study. Uh, and we have deposited our sequences there so that uh, it is available for the global scientific community to understand what is going on in Sri Lanka and to see if unusual things are happening here. And so according to the GIS uh, 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 classification, there are ma seven major strains. These are the strains worldwide. And in Sri Lanka, of course, we have only experienced certain strains uh, and not all the seven strains. 
And of course, these change, strains change over time. Uh, as you can see in the world, uh, over time, certain strains became dominant uh, in Asia and in Sri Lanka also, the ch ch strains changed. But then, uh, how different are our current strains from the previous ones? So I know you don't understand this, I will explain, but this is just to show the blue dots are the ones uh, that were there uh, previously, and these uh, orange ones are the current strain. I'll explain what all this is about. So in March, of course, you know that a lot of people were escaping COVID-19 in those countries and came to Sri Lanka from Italy, South Korea, name it, they came from everywhere. So in March, we had so many different types of strains circulating in Sri Lanka, reflecting the uh, uh, migration of people from all over the world. And then we had the CMC cluster in April. Again, it was several strains. But when it came to Kandakadu, it was just one strain. So here, the, although there are several viral sequences, it falls on, on, in the same place uh, because it's the same virus. So now I will explain what a phylogenetic tree is uh, so that you will understand what I'm talking about. So we'll talk about cats the cat family, which all of you are familiar about. So you know that there are lions, tigers, uh, leopards, uh, and, and all different cats, and they originated from a single ancestor. So this is where the single one ancestor is, and from this ancestor, you got clouded leopards, which are genetically different uh, from these uh, cats. And, uh, and this common ancestor uh, was responsible for the tiger snow leopard and uh, these ancestors for the lion and leopard. So when you look at this uh, phylogenetic tree, the snow leopard is mostly genetically similar to the tiger and not the lion. And, and by looking at these phylogenetic trees, you can understand when did this uh, happen, uh, this division happen? When, this, this, when did this ancestor, ancestor give rise to two branches uh, going into clouded leopard and this uh, uh, whatever animal that was there? Uh, so you can basically understand that. So the, this is the common ancestor of A, uh, B, and C, whereas this is the common ancestor of B and C. You can apply this to viruses. And uh, this is the common ancestor of the whale viruses, bat viruses, and all these viruses. And this is, uh, this is the common ancestor of these bat viruses, camel, human, and bat viruses. So coming to this now, sort of you got the, I hope you got understood the phylogenetic tree. So one of the big questions that we had is, of course, when we got this epidemic this time, the outbreak this time, is it the virus that was last seen in Sri Lanka, which was the Kandahar virus uh, going underground and then suddenly emerging uh, at the end of September, or is it something that came uh, somewhere from uh, some other country? So, uh, and uh, to answer that, we can just compare uh, the current sequences which are here with the Kandahar sequences which are here. So you, uh, for, to you, it is very obvious that the Kandahar sequences are very much different from the current sequences. Okay, so that is number one. And of course, this is uh, just data of some of our strains. So you know, the first Minuangore patient uh, was diagnosed on the 3rd of October. So this is the first Minuangore patient. But when you look at this ancestral tree, uh, other patients found in Minuangore and of course the Beruela fish cluster and so on, I mean, those viruses branched off early. So based on this phylogenetic data, it looks like this particular virus came to Sri Lanka sort of end of, uh, sort of early September and then gave rise to this uh, outbreak, which makes sense because when you look at, when you take the history of the Brandix cluster, people started showing symptoms from 18th of September. So it looks like this whatever virus was introduced early September and uh, uh, then spread around based, just based on this uh, phylogenetic data. Then, you have this pangolin uh, lineages, which uh, gives a sign to various uh, lineages, which I'll explain. So based on these lineages, it divides into B, A, B, and C. So uh, B uh, is based on uh, the initial lineage in China. So we have B.1, B.1.1, B.1.1.1. Okay, you can go on like that. Uh, based on di different lineages. So our initial, our lineages is this B.1, which is a large European lineage, but that is where it originated from. That doesn't mean that the current virus originated from that, because uh, if you look at these current strains uh, in blue and compare them to the, all the global viral strains, so the website I showed you next strain has all the global viral strains, so you can actually find out 
what is uh, it, what it is most related to. I mean, any of you can just go to that website, search for Sheila constraints, and and do this exercise, and you can find out what are the strains it is most related to. That doesn't say that it came from anywhere. It just shows that what it is related to. And coming to the significant mutations of the virus. So uh, all of you, I hope, know that there's this thing called the spike uh, protein, which binds to the receptor, by, which has a receptor binding domain, bind to the S2 receptor. And so if there are mutations in this particular protein, it might be good, it might be bad. So there are two important mutations, the D614G mutation and this one found in Sri Lanka, but this is the significant one which I'll talk about. So initially, uh, the strain found all over the world was this D614 virus, which was replaced by the G614 virus. So if you look at the D614 strain, it produces somewhat a particular viral load. But this G614 strain produces much more viruses than the initial virus strain because of the affinity of binding to that receptor. So uh, 15 out of 16 current strains are, have this mutation and that's why we are seeing high viral loads in patients. So now a little bit about what that means. I, uh, the CT value, of course, even the people on the road know what the CT value is uh, these days. So CT value is inversely proportionate to the viral load. So it, it basically gives you when the, uh, when, when the particular nucleic acid in that reaction starts amplifying. So the lower the viral load, uh, the, uh, the, high, uh, the, lower the, uh, the lower the viral load, the higher the, higher the CT value. So this was what we were seeing earlier, but currently in this epidemic, we see CT values coming up very early. So to summarize this part of my talk, so it just means the current strain came from somewhere and possibly uh, arrived in Sri Lanka end of August or early September. It is the same strain that is, was circulating everywhere in Sri Lanka as of 19th of October. Things could have changed now. Uh, as of now, we are sequencing uh, the virus in, uh, in our lab. I don't know, uh, it doesn't work every time we sequence uh, as, as most experiments don't. So let's see what will happen. This particular virus has a very, very high transmissibility rate, but there are no significant mutations that uh, so far affect the neutralizing antibodies and vaccine efficacy. The reason I'm saying that is, you know about a mink mutation going around that does affect the binding of neutralizing antibodies. And there's another nasty mutation, which is currently seen in 0.1% of viral strains in the world, again, affecting the binding of neutralizing antibodies and therefore would possibly affect vaccine efficacy. Then going to the second part. Now we wanted to look at chemokines, cytokines, and all these inflammatory markers to answer certain questions, uh, to understand why, uh, what sort of cytokines and chemokines associate with disease severity. Again, because uh, at that time there were IL-6 receptor blockers, people were talking about are, are those effective? If so, what are we finding? Uh, whether these can be used as predictors? And we had a lot of experience studying inflammatory markers in dengue. So just to understand how different or similar it is to, uh, if, if possible, to find out therapeutic targets. So what we did is we compared the cytokine levels and chemokine levels in patients with severe pneumonia. That is the WHO definition of severe pneumonia with uh, individuals with pneumonia less than uh, nine, uh, oxy uh, oxygen saturation less than 90% at uh, room yeah, or more than 30 breaths per minute. And we also want to look at these prolonged shedders. So in Sri Lanka, unlike other countries, until quite recently, I, I would say until July, you had to have two negative PCRs 24 hours apart to be discharged from hospital. This meant some people were in hospital for 50 days, 60 days, and even 63 days. Uh, so we did have this group of individuals who were prolonged shedders. Some people just clear the virus in two or three days, and actually after seven days, they were okay. So why is it that some people keep on uh, shedding for a prolonged time, whereas some people clear it? Is it because they can't handle the virus properly? And we also looked at mild illness. Uh, these are the individuals who, who clear the virus early. So we measured 17 different types of uh, cytokines at the first week, second week, uh, and again uh, at, at the fourth week uh, in those who were in hospital. So the fourth week cytokines were not measured in individuals with mild infection. And we use this MagPIC technology, which in which you can measure 36 type of analytes in just 50 microliters of uh, serum or plasma, and we studied other aspects. 
So these are the cytokines and chemokines we looked at. So we looked at uh, uh, CD40 ligand, GMCSF, uh, MIP3-alpha, and all these uh, uh, cytokines, intron gamma IL-1, beta IL-2, IL-4, and, and so on. So just to talk about the results. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to show you all the results and, and bore you, but just the important ones. So uh, this uh, uh, cytokine, intron gamma. So that is a very potent in, uh, antiviral cytokine. And as you can see in people who sub subsequently succumb to the illness, they had very low levels at the beginning uh, in the first week compared to people with mild illness. So they, they are not mounting a good antiviral response. In contrast, people who succumb to the illness had very high levels of IL-10 compared to patients with mild illness. Uh, so IL-10 is a potent um, immunosuppressive cytokine. So severe pe patients with severe pneumonia and who succumb to the illness didn't have a good antiviral response and had a, a immunosuppressive response instead. And of course, they had very high levels of IL-6. So these are the people with pneumonia and you can't even see the values in those with mild illness and prolonged shedding. So these are some of the other cytokines. I won't uh, take you through that, but basically most of the cytokines were very much high in patients with severe pneumonia and those who subsequently died. So we wanted to see, okay, how does this compare with uh, dengue shock, uh, not dengue shock actually, none of these patients went into shock, uh, but dengue hemorrhagic fever and dengue fever. So uh, now I just told you that patients who had severe pneumonia had very high levels of IL-10, which is an immunosuppressive cytokine. But when you compare with dengue fever or dengue hemorrhagic fever, uh, so the time points of DF and uh, this time point A and B are very different in severe pneumonia uh, in COVID versus uh, dengue. In COVID time point A is first week, time point B is second week, which is when they get severe illness. In dengue time point A is the febrile phase, time point B is the critical phase. Uh, because it doesn't go on like that. But in dengue, you can see people have very high levels of immunosuppressive cytokines, and even people who succumb to their illness, uh, I mean, you can't even see it. Whereas in uh, COVID, you have high levels of IL-6, uh, and the most in important thing I would like to highlight here is this for the CD40 ligand. So CD40 ligand is associated with thrombosis, uh, and, and because of that acute lung injury. So patients with COVID, especially during the second week, had very high levels, rising levels of CD40 ligand. And so that shows the thrombotic uh, in, uh, uh, tendency that we see in patients with COVID. And we know that uh, in autopsy findings, they have shown about 50 to 60% of people who died of COVID had uh, thrombotic events. So to summarize the key findings, Patients with severe COVID had impaired antiviral responses, so they couldn't handle the virus very well, and uh, had high levels of immunosuppressive cytokines. And I just talked about a, a group of people who had prolonged shedding, uh, and when you compare the individuals who had prolonged shedding with those who cleared the virus early, those with prolonged shedding had very high levels of immunosuppressive cytokines, again, in the first week. So they didn't have a good immune response. And of course, this interesting finding of CD40 ligand being high, especially rising towards the second week, which we want to investigate later, uh, more. So this paper has been published uh, this week uh, in scientific reports. Now coming to the final part, which is the antibody responses of COVID. Uh, so we wanted to know how antibody responses associated with clinical disease severity, whether they are associated with early viral clearance, how long do they persist? A good question for vaccines. And of course, the, one of the main reasons we wanted to measure neutralizing antibodies because there were recommendations, uh, people were interested in convalescent plasma. And there was a recommendation that if you are using convalescent plasma, you have to use convalescent plasma with uh, individuals from high neutralizing antibodies. So in order to help uh, all the clinicians uh, choose patients uh, to, to um, prepare convalescent plasma, it is also important to measure neutralizing antibodies. So what we used was this, uh, th this the assay we used has just uh, been approved. It was the first assay to be approved for detecting neutralizing antibodies. So we were uh, working closely with Proxel Limfavan from Duke in US before COVID. So uh, we, he was already a collaborator. So uh, Duke and US developed this assay and before uh, publishing it or anything, they sent it to us so that we could also use it and work on it. And uh, so this is a surrogate neutralizing antibody assay. I won't explain how it works. Uh, so we wanted to look at uh, longitudinal responses in patients with severe, moderate, 
prolonged shedding, which is the same uh, what, uh, what I defined earlier, and those with mild infection, and different uh, time po points uh, of disease severity. So, uh, uh, so these are the green uh, lines are those of mild infection. So some individuals with mild infection did make early antibodies, but some of them even later on did not make any neutralizing antibodies. Those with prolonged shedding did much better. They did make antibodies. And these red lines are those who actually had severe pneumonia. So they had a very good antibody response, but of course still developed uh, severe pneumonia. Uh, we were very confused why this was happening. You have a good antibody response. Uh, you are unable to clear the virus. And also you seem to be uh, basically dying also if you have a good antibody response. So whether it was because of antibody dependent enhancement like we see in dengue, uh, because we know that uh, that cross reacts, but but recently uh, there was a paper coming out, uh, came out showing why, and because these neutralizing antibodies in these individuals are not the optimum. Uh, th these uh, B cells haven't undergone the proper changes to produce. I won't uh, name those like somatic hypermutation, affinity maturation, those type of things, and there are not produced in the germinal center, so they are less good. Uh, the quality is inferior. So in, instead of neutralizing, they do other nasty things. Uh, so this is again uh, showing over the uh, over the time period from first week uh, to uh, four to eight week, and and you can see in the initial phases, uh, both uh, mild illness uh, individuals in mild illness, most of them don't make antibodies. But uh, later on, although everybody with prolonged illness or severe illness make antibodies, still those with mild illness don't seem to be doing much. And the persistence, this is the other question that everybody is interested in. How long do they persist? Uh, so yeah, I mean, a lot of people did develop antibodies, especially towards uh, the, the four or five weeks, but then you see this pattern of losing the antibodies. So after 90 days, uh, about 48.5% of individuals did not have detectable neutralizing antibodies. And these individuals are not individuals who had severe disease or moderate disease or prolonged shedding, actually these are mild and uh, who had mild or asymptomatic illness. So this is just the data of 76 individuals uh, from time point A, which is th three to four weeks, and time point B, which is 13 to 16 weeks. As you can see in most individuals, the antibody levels drop, but of course you have always odd characters where the antibody levels rise uh, from, time point to time, uh, from time point A to time point B. So the key findings are, uh, early occurrence of uh, neutralizing antibodies was not associated with milder disease. Those who had prolonged shedding did have high titers of neutralizing antibodies, but still continued to shed. And uh, so, and this, uh, of course, there's explanation for why uh, you get high levels of neutralizing antibodies. But the worrying fact is that uh, these antibodies disappear. So now talking about vaccines, there's this question that if you get vaccines, uh, it, it might not be lifelong immunity and you might have to vaccinate people every year based on uh, the data coming up. So, and, and this is uh, under review and currently available as a preprint on uh, uh, Research Square. So of course, I'm very happy to say that all of this research was done in our lab, every single thing I uh, spoke about. And I would like to uh, thank our funding agencies, uh, uh, the university funds, the uh, WHO, British High Commission, uh, University of Oxford, and the MRC Human Immunology Unit. And of course, this is, uh, although I presented all this data, it was a huge collective effort of a, of a, a lot of individuals. I especially like to thank Dr. Chandima Jeevandara, who is my colleague and who runs around and makes things happen. Without him, these things would not happen. Uh, uh, Professor Surangi Asavardhana, our dean, who is so supportive. Our vice chancellor, Professor uh, uh, Lianage. Our previous vice chancellor and current UG chairman, Professor Sampat Amaratunga. Then this is Professor Graham Mogg, uh, my PhD supervisor. It's true that I finished my PhD 12 years ago, but he's still my mentor and he guides me uh, throughout everything I do as far as science and, and the career is concerned. And of course, our collaborators, uh, Dr. Anandi Vijay Vikrama, Dr. Eranga, uh, Dr. Damayanti Dampiti, I just couldn't find her photo. So I've just written her name, Dr. Malika and Dr. Uh, uh, Suranga, who, uh, uh, 
who are involved in all these studies. Uh, Dr. Suranga was uh, involved in the antibody part of the study. And uh, as I said, it's a huge teamwork. Otherwise, you can't uh, work so fast and get data for COVID. And this is, these are our CMC collaborators. We work very closely with the CMC. They help with our antibody studies and also with our T-cell studies, which I'm not uh, discussing. We are still, uh, these studies are still ongoing. Uh, we are also doing a, a zero surveillance in the CMC area with them. So this is Dr. Dinu Guruge and Dr. Ruan Vijayamuni. Then our uh, foreign collaborators, Professor Ling Favan, as I mentioned, for the neutralizing antibody assay, and Dr. Tushan De Silva from University of Sheffield. We took advice on sequencing because this was the first time we did it in Sri Lanka. Then Professor Alan Townsend from University of Oxford. He has developed a very cheap antibody assay, again, to look at neutralizing antibodies. And you don't need any machine. You can just do it on your benchtop. We have evaluated it. We are using it now. Uh, not for diagnostics, but it is a beautiful essay. Uh, Professor Theodong, who is a collaborator in our T-cell work. And as I said, this is our team, and I really excuse you for taking your time to talk about these individuals, but they mean so much to me. As I said, this is Dr. Chandima Jeevandara, Deshni, who is a postdoc, Laksiri, a senior scientist, Pradeep, who has submitted his PhD, Dinuka, a PhD student, Shaira, a PhD student, Raj, a research assistant, uh, uh, Se Sepali, sorry, Saubhagya, a research assistant, uh, Shashi, a PhD student, Deshan, a research assistant, Tushali, uh, a medical officer, Samali, a PhD student, Dianath, who is a bioinformatics, uh, uh, helps in bioinformatics, Vimal, a research assistant, Sepali, research assistant, uh, uh, Dumni, a PhD student, Thibu, uh, submitted his PhD, Ayesha, a senior uh, scientist, Tehani, a PhD student, Achala is actually a, a senior lecturer in Colombo nursing faculty, but uh, uh, still works with me. Uh, Heishan, research assistant, uh, Diniti, our immunology uh, coordinator in our immunology department, uh, Lakshita, again a coordinator, Yohan uh, is a junior research assistant, Banuri, a postdoc, and uh, Gayasha, our statistician. So these are the individuals that make it happen. Then finally, of course, my family, my parents and my brother, sister, and their family, my nieces and nephews, who support me uh, in good times and especially in bad times. And finally, our family, my husband, Lasantha, and my children, who are my pillars of strength and support me, especially Lasantha. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for that truly insightful presentation into the topic of the hour, COVID-19, which provided us with a bird's eye view into your valuable work in piecing together the puzzle that is the COVID-19 virus. Thank you very much, Madam. <laughs>